So I'm going to stay on mute most of the time because they're jackhammering out on the street. And uh, they have been working on that for so long. I don't understand what the problem is. I don't yeah. know. Hello. It's pretty awful. Um, but I had a question as well, and it was it's about muscle cramping. Okay. Uh, excessively, especially with our friend that has uh, the ALS. Okay. Just, it's yeah. really hard to get through much, very far, because he just cramps up quite a bit. So just um, if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, I'm happy to address that question about muscle cramping, especially in ALS. And then Allegra had sent me ahead a question about um, the cauda equina syndrome. So we can talk about that too. And then our theme for going forward for this coming week that I had uh, on the docket is scapula and the scapular connection. Uh, so we could talk about that a little bit too, unless you guys have other questions that you want to bring to the table, we can talk about those as well. So let me address the muscle cramping, muscle cramping in general. Muscle cramping in general, we don't really know why exactly people muscle cramp. There are a number of reasons why muscles cramp. One is lack of nutrients. So um, that could be some of the minerals like calcium, magnesium, potassium. So when somebody moves into a more dehydrated state, the, the level of mineral versus water in the body shifts. And so sometimes lack of those minerals in particular, calcium, magnesium, potassium, can cause muscle cramping and often related to some partial or full kind of dehydration going on at the time. So, and the, the balance of salt minerals and the water in the body. So that's where the things like electrolyte, I, I prefer electrolyte based waters rather than all those electrolyte drinks or coconut water. I, I prefer to, to go to so the nat more natural co coconut water or just the waters that are infused with electrolytes rather than all the power drinks and stuff that are supposed to be so helpful just because I like things on a simple level. But sometimes when you're really dehydrated, it's really hard to drink a um, just water. It's interesting how if you've ever been dehydrated, you might have experienced that, that it's really hard to get yourself to drink water, in which case something with a little bit of something like the sports drinks do come in handy. So or those tablets that you can drop in to can be handy at that point. So that's one side, that's a really easy fix. That's just fitness and adjusting fitness, um, fitness and water intake. So that's, that's probably the easiest fix of muscle cramping. And what you would see in that case would be uh, random muscles cramping throughout the body. It could be that the hamstrings on one side cramp and then the hand or the fingers cramp on another side or um, it wouldn't be just one muscle in particular every week that you're seeing is cramping on that particular person. Usually that's not the case. Um, so if we take it to another level of possibility for muscle cramping, and especially if someone with a neurological issue like ALS or um, any other, even a person who has some nerve compression of some kind, so what we determined when we had the discussion on ALS is that the nerves are degenerating the myelin sheath. The sheath around the nerve is not doing as well, right? So the information from brain to nerve is being disruptive. So when disrupted, so when that happens, you have your muscle fiber, right? All, all my muscle fibers all bound up. If this was, it would be kind of circular bound up muscle fibers. So the nerves, some of the nerves are getting information to some of the muscle bundle fibers, and some of the muscle bundle fibers are not getting information, right? So then you put somebody in a, typically it happens in a more shortened working position. So bridging is a great example, right? A lot of people will cramp in bridging or better yet bottomless or bridging on the roller when they're rolling in and out. Uh, and that is because the hamstrings are in a shortened position. Oh, it's it getting broken sound. Are you guys getting my, not getting my sound? You're okay. Um, so 
if if your muscle is in a shortened position, it takes a little more uh, force, muscle contraction force to work. Um, it's a shortened position, and it's the most likely position where the muscle might cramp, right? So if that's the case, then um, the, you're more likely to cramp in that shortened position. Um, and if you're not getting all the information to all the muscle fibers, that's gonna that's gonna make the likelihood of cramping even more. So we we think of it also with muscle weakness. So imagine it's not a neurological issue. So not ALS or not a nerve impingement, even somebody who's just weak. They're gonna cramp in a shortened position until their body is strong enough to hold their body, uh, to hold the muscle, to work the muscle in that shortened range. So, so that is, I think, probably in the case of ALS, I think he's just not getting enough information to enough of the muscle fibers. And the ones that are working are working so hard that they're ending up in a bit of a spasm, right? A cramp is essentially a bit of a spasm. And you'll see that with people who have disc problems or nerve impingement problems as well. For full nerve impingement problems, you'll see the similar situation. So we've just yep. been working through it or stopping and moving to the other leg and coming back. Is that the right thing to do? Yeah, I think giving, giving breaks. So what you're doing with somebody who has a neurological condition or a blockage, you need to help strengthen that side anyway, because we want two things for somebody with a, a, a brain to muscle issue like ALS is we either want the fibers around to get stronger. So the muscle fibers that are still getting information are gonna get stronger and stay strong as long as possible. Or we want the body mind connection to find a different route to those muscle fibers. So we want to ask for work. And sometimes that's possible depending on a lot of factors. It's possible sometimes for the brain to muscle to find a different pathway to get the information to the muscles. And sometimes it's not. And in a, at this stage, um, this is for those who don't know, this is somebody who has ALS was newly diagnosed. So at this stage, there may be other ways to get the information there because there's enough still nerve pathways. Over time, those pathways will shut down with ALS. But in a situation of a stroke, for example, someone with a stroke, those pathways might open up and stay opened up for a good long period of time. So it, it's good to encourage but then if he gets in big spasm, just stop, stretch it out, and maybe change the angle, right? The leg angle. Maybe put the legs up on a block, if we're still talking about bridging. Put the legs up on a ball or on a block or some, some other positioning so that it would allow for a, just a different angle. And then the muscle fibers can be a little longer or a little shorter, and sometimes that helps. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Any other questions about that or thoughts? All right. Good. So then, um, Allegra, thank you for your email and questions. I'm going to do a quick summary, or maybe I'll let you ask the question again, just so everybody knows what your question was about the client or problem question. Is that OK? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, everybody. Lager, Lori, nice, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, I was just, um, work, so I have been working with a client for like a year and a half, maybe a year. Um, she's a little overweight. She's 200 pounds, uh, my age, for late forties, um, my height five, seven. And, um, she has, uh, it's called cow, cow, I'm not cow to equina. Cow yeah. And there's, it's basically a, a bunch of nerves. That's, I guess it, they call it that. Cause it's like a, a saddle kind of horse. It's like, it passes through right tail, the, the tail. Yeah. Like right at the, the bottom, the tailbone, like through the, the pelvis. And, um, what happened was, is that, um, I think she just has like, I think, well, what you were saying, Zana, that she's overweight. Um, but what happened was, is that the, the disc, uh, it bulged and it burst. So the, the goop leaked out. So the, the nucleus is at the, the nucleus populus and anus. Yeah. 
So, and anyway, so the pathway with, so you have to go into surgery right away. Usually she goes into surgery and um, the effect of that is that her um, it's on both sides. She feels like her nerves are affected and the canal is really, really small for, um, you know, for those nerves to pass through now. And so she's a belly dancer and uh, she's hyper flexible. And so, you know, all those things are sort of against her and um, it's, we've just been working. I was doing strengthening before and she likes to swim too. So um, we were working on strengthening, but now I am decided that I'm just going to work on stability and getting her strong in the core uh, because she does her doctor has requested that she wear something like a corset, even when she walks her dog, which uh, she doesn't really like to do it because it, she says it takes her like an hour to get in it. And I mean, yeah, like I, I, I understand. Um, but um, yeah, it's just um, any move like weight on her feet, um, it causes pain. I mean, um, you know, sometimes legs and tabletop or, um, that that's one we can do, but she was just having a lot of, a lot of pain yesterday. Um, so I just kind of kept it really mellow. I really just tried to work on the breathing and getting her gauge in the transverse abs, because one of the things that can happen in this cauda equina is that you lose the sensation of like basically holding in or those like, you know, holding in your guts there, like, you know, like, um, you know, peeing, pooping, those kinds of things. Um, so she says that she has awareness of it now, but, um, I'm just kind of like, I'm not sure what even to do with her anymore because I just feel like anything bothers her. And she always likes to, um, do, you know, do the prone swimming because she swims, but I think it's, uh, from what you had mentioned, Zaina, that it's causing even just that compression in her um, lower back. And I think, so yeah, just kind of what, what I can do, what I can't do. Balancing throws her off and balancing, you know, we did balancing on the chair and it throws her off, you know, on the foot bar, one in front of the other, because for her and her, it, 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 it evokes like a flight or fight kind of response. And it, it's almost like her doctor said, it's like too jarring for her system. And it just like, uh, it's so, so it's almost like her body's like falling and trying to catch it. And so that something like that will throw her off for like days. And she takes um, gabapentin, oxy, and she's really just trying to manage. Um, so anyway, I did I, I don't even, yeah, I guess my question is, I'm not sure what to do with her anymore. And what's the best approach stability than strength and what positions like I guess now I'm just going to start on her back and get strong there and then move on yeah uh, thanks Olivia. so uh, if you guys don't mind what I'll do is I'll just share my screen for a minute I just have one picture up of the spinal cord and the cauda equina just so that you guys can see a little bit oh great um, oh, great great idea yeah. Uh, okay, so here, what we have here is this picture of the cauda equina. Cauda equina, like Allegra said, I'm going to repeat a few things she said, is this is the base of the spinal cord. The spinal cord, remember, is housed inside the vertebra, so in the very center of the vertebra, and then the arms of the vertebra would be out to both sides, right? The transverse processes of lumbar is where we are right here, where my little cursor is moving. And then this, these nerve, this nerve bundle is the cauda equina, which stands for in Latin is horse's tail, right? Because it looks like a tail and it's a feathered tail, right? And that, these nerves that come out from here go down into the lower extremities, but also, and more important, go into the per perineal area, which is bowel and bladder control. Um, they, that are really marked for cauda equina syndrome. So the bowel bladder, that lower pelvic floor is what you're thinking is not functioning. And that's what I think Allegra was alluding to, that she doesn't feel as much down there. And so it's really hard to train somebody to go deep in their abdominals, right? If they have less or changed sensation in that region. Yeah. So here, uh, this is also housed in between the, kind of in that sacral area. 
So when you think about the sacrum, if we look again at the SI joint here, just to remember what that is more like. So on this image here, you can see, right, sacro to ilia, the sacrum and coming down the ilia attaching here. You see the holes in the sacrum here, right? And you can picture that that horse's tail is coming through these little holes, right? Sacral nerves, and they're going in to feed this whole perineal area, right? Here's another picture where you can kind of see that connection, right? It's a ligamentous and muscular connection, and the nerves would be coming out of the spinal cord here and down into this region through here. So we, that is where we're going to find the cauda equina coming out. Thinking about that, the nerves that come down in and through there are going to go to the legs as well, right? So remember that we have all the lumbar nerves coming out and becoming the sciatic nerve, the rest of them coming down and into the whole lower extremity region. So her injury was a disc herniation, which is what Allegra was explaining, herniation versus disc bulge, right? Bulge is when the outer annulus sticks out of place and can potentially hit a nerve on one side or the other, usually on one side or the other. The herniation, what happens there is the annulus, the center, the, um, sorry, the nucleus, it explodes, what Allegra said. And when it explodes, you can imagine, if you want to imagine that you imagine that acid comes out of there, right? So acid comes out and it burns the structures around, the nerves around in this case got really affected. And it's really dangerous if it's in that lower sacrum area and it gets to the cauda equina, right? That, that horse's tail, because you can lose all functions down below. So that's why they rush the surgery. They do a laminectomy or laminotomy, which means they take away part of the vertebral structure to create enough space for that central cord, which is where the cauda equina is central cord, to have enough room for those nerves to be free. And when they're free, then they can function. If they get compressed, they're gonna stop functioning and she's gonna lose probably a lot more function than, than and be in a lot more shape than she would have been now, right? She would have potentially lost leg function as well as bladder and bowel function, yeah? So that's why they rushed to surgery for that. So now in this rehab, she's a super sensitive person. And my email, or email discussion, Allegra, and my email discussion, I had first mentioned that although it's a super difficult topic to talk about, the heavier weight on the spine and the spinal cord, the worse it is, and the worse the symptoms are going to be. So for somebody who's five seven and about 200 pounds, that's, there is some room there um, for weight loss. Um, it's, again, super sensitive and super difficult for somebody who's in pain to lose weight, right? So there, there's uh, the fact that they can't move as much as they'd want to be moving in the first place is a huge factor. And the, uh, the fact that they're in pain and potentially just a little bit depressed about their situation, right? Well, those things come together. It makes it super hard for anybody to lose weight who's in that situation. But the research really backs the fact that if you lose weight, spinal issues get so much better. And so many people feel so much better just because there's less load on the spinal cord or the spine, spinal nerves or the spine itself. So if there's a way, if you're in that situation with a client and there's a way for you to very gently talk about that subject um, in a very loving way, then I would recommend that you do that. And if you don't feel like you can, sometimes if, if they have a good working relationship with a doctor, sometimes you might mention it to the doctor yourself or write a letter to the doctor. Or if you have any way to communicate, sometimes you can do that and have the doctor go that approach with her. Um, yeah, and then just, the other, sorry, go ahead. About for a second. Yeah, I was, um, I totally agree with that. And she, my client agrees with that too, because she said, you know, she used to be so active yoga, belly dancing, this and that and that. And it's like now exercises causes her pain and that's the way, you know, losing weight, you know, she's also going through menopause right now too. So as you can imagine, like the she saw her hormones are like wacky too. So it's just, yeah, that's, she's like, well, I want to exercise, but I don't, you know, cause I'm going to be in pain. And so it's like, she knows she needs to lose weight, but the, like there's the fear and just, yeah, it gets all wrapped up in there. So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think sometimes referring back to the doctor for that, if they know that they're in that situation and you can talk about either referring them directly back or saying, hey, could I talk to your doctor about this? Because I just want to check in and see what else we can do or what else can be done. And then you might mention it, would weight loss help this person? Would you be able to talk to her about it? You know, that, that you could do. Um, and then, then we talked about positioning and movement. And so Allegra was so kind to send me a list of what she had done. Um, and I, Allegra, I think you're doing a great job. I think it's a really tough situation that you're in. And I think it would be really hard for anybody to work with her and not have her have some sort of pain or discomfort. But my suggestion was to get rid of all the exercises in prone for now. And even though she's swimming and she likes swimming, I think um, the reason that I say that is because if you think about nerve compression generally, right? I know that this was originally a disc herniation, but what it turned into was a nerve compression at the spinal cord. So if you think about what causes a smaller space for the spinal cord is actually extension-based work. And Allegra did prone uh, on the arc, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Allegra, but you did prone on the arc and then glute series there. So she had some spinal flexion doing um, the swimming legs and clicking Charlie Chaplin. But I think uh, she's probably not strong enough in her abdomen to support her spine when she's in prone and there may be some even sometimes it's such a small movement in the spine that even if she is strong she can't prevent when she's prone so it may so i would say just as a suggestion try not doing anything in prone for a week or two and see if that helps her have less symptoms post post session yeah. that would be that would be one of my recommendations and then I think your best bet is what you said, is to just work on stability. I think she needs to develop a lot more stability probably before you can even really strengthen, unless you can totally support her in that stable place. And so we need, you would need to probably support her with a pillow under her buttocks and move her into a more flat back, not really so neutral as we, you know, we like to have people on neutral working in neutral, but I don't, I think I would just support her as much as possible. So laying down on her back pillow or a little wedge under her bottom and get her there situated. And even then maybe uh, putting something on her feet to take weight away from her, which would be either a TheraBand, her feet in a TheraBand, or you could use the springs from the tower springboard perhaps to do uh, to just unload the spine or the the bar and the knees over the bar. Those yeah, are the, we, we did that the knees over bar and she's like, oh, this feels really good. So yeah, she that was that was um, I didn't put that in the notes, but yeah, that's the the unweighting there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so the knees over bar. Well, you could even work with her feet in the trapeze of the Cadillac and have her doing like tabletop legs or predict the load, we call it moving in and out there. You can even have her do a one foot down, a one foot moving in and out, like a single leg stretch modified, but with the one foot either in the spring or in the trapeze, mm -hmm. something so that she's very supported pelvis and lower, lower belly pelvis back is really supported, SI joint really supported, and then only one leg moving at a time. The only awkward contraindication that you might be thinking of that I know I've told you those of you who know me before is with SI joint issues, you don't want to move one leg off of the other leg. But in this scenario, we just want to do what we can to stabilize it. If she's not strong enough for two legs to move together, stabilize the pelvis with one leg down and then just move one leg and see if that, that can work. Yeah. 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 And that's something the stabilizing, like I've even, um, I don't have a sandbag, but it's like this Buckley thing. It's a little bit heavy, like to put on her hips, like hands on her hips. So when she puts one leg up, she can see, Oh, is my pelvis moving or not? So that was like a light bulb for her when we put the hands on the pelvis. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, all right. Any other cases, questions, other things that you guys have that you wanted to ask? Hi, Hi. Um, I, I'm curious about um, general approaches for managing clients with arthritis, particularly when it's flared up. 
Okay. Is it more like an osteoarthritis you're thinking or a rheumatoid type of, like all uh, over the body? Or? I think in general, most of the folks I'm working with, it's osteoarthritis, it's sort of garden variety. Yeah. yeah and it okay. tends to flare when people have got active elders who like to go out and work in their garden. It happens, seems to happen a lot around uh, winter holidays, maybe not this year, but in past years, all these cooking injuries is what it seems like just because it's, you know, just doing too much for too long. And you know, yeah, any general principles for that would be helpful. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so osteoarthritis in general, um, like normally we see it with um, bigger joints or weight bearing joints, right? The knees, the hips, uh, shoulders can be too. Um, and then definitely we have stenosis or arthritis in the back or a spondylolysis, we call it, in the spine. Um, but if we're talking about arthritis, arthritis is a tricky little beast because too much and they're gonna hurt, not enough and they won't get stronger. So it's a really a balancing game between working them just enough to get them stronger, but without them having any pain or soreness after your session for, for sure. And then potentially also in life, knowing how to figure that out for themselves in, in their life. So typically, um, I'll, I'll take an example of like osteoarthritis of the knee. So something that if you had somebody with osteoarthritis of the knee that is not, not operated, uh, there's a lot of things that you could watch for in studio. So one is usually range of motion. So if you, we want to strengthen somebody with arthritis and we want to make sure their alignment is as ideal as possible, right? With osteoarthritis in the knee, a lot of times you'll start to see the knee going inward in that knock knee or valgus direction too. So what a great thing to do is to work all around the joint. So for example, if I start to, ha if I have an osteoarthritis knee, I want to work inner thighs, I want to work outer thighs, I want to work um, quads, I want to work hamstrings, right? So I want to get all sides, inside, outside, quad, and backside. Um, you also need to include in that the hip rotators and glute medius, because glute medius, right, holds people up over the leg. If glute medius is weak, we get that hip check out to the side on that stance leg, right? And that's going to take the knee inward even more. So our goal is to have both sides of the knee aligned all the time, right? Not one side pressed or the other side pressed as what starts to happen with arthritis is the, there's some wear and tear is generally more medial. And so they end up more like this and more pressure in that medial side of the joint. So we want to strengthen the outer, which for us in the knee is interesting because IT band is on that outer side, but there's not really a muscular contractile force of IT band at the knee. We get that up at your hip and butt, right? So we get that up here. That's our kind of where we can get support and stability for the outer leg. So it's here, front, back, and inside. And then the other thing, doing sometimes really small, small range of motion is actually fine. So if we took footwork and it hurts them to press all the way in, all the way out, keeping them in a shortened range, but allowing them that movement and with you making those corrections for good alignment so their knees not wobbling all over the place, even if you have to do a shortened range and a lighter weight at first, just to get them going, that's really good because we can then start to strengthen in that range and you're also asking the synovial fluids around the joint to start pumping some fluid. So you're causing a little bit of lubrication of the joints. But if you work in the full range, which is, I know, we, we always like to try and get the full range ideally in Pilates, but if we work that full range, we're gonna get to the end range and grind the knee. And so by the end range, they might be more sore than more supple. So we're trying to keep us in a, as little pain as possible with as much movement. If, if we take them to the hips, one of my favorite things to do at, with the hips is actually put legs in straps and have them go through circles. And actually, it's the one time where I actually try and make the circles a little bigger than just the controlled. I'm very much a stay tight and keep control, but sometimes making those circles a little bit bigger 
actually helps lubricate the joint. Again, in a pain-free zone, pain-free pain range for them, but then we can ask the body to create a little more fluid and just sort of lubricate the hip joint a little bit. So not, not too much load. And then we would, I would also recommend working like not fully standing. Footwork is fantastic for both hips and knees because it's not full body weight. Legs and straps tend to be really good if you can keep the control over the joints and they're not wobbly all over, right? Because it's not full body weight. And so you'll get more motion when it's not full load of weight as you would in standing. So even like seated chair presses, those could be great. Um, and hopefully get them strong for a while and then maybe start working with a little more load at a time, like then seated on the chair perhaps versus reformer so that you're progressively strengthening. Does that help? Yeah, what about um, anything specific for arthritis in the spine? In the spine? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so if we're talking about spine, we're... What, what becomes, what starts to happen is like all the joints, the bone overgrows or gets spiky. And so a lot of times the nerves get entrapped as they're exiting the spine. So the space for the cord and for the arms or the peripheral nerves can get a lot smaller. And this, so I usually, we want to avoid extension or lumbar spine extension. Uh, people usually who have arthritis in the spine will complain of pain um, usually after standing or that museum walking is what we call it, that start stop walking is a lot of times really uncomfortable for people who have arthritis in the spine. Um, but once they get going, they feel a little bit better. So it's again that same idea of lubricating and feeling a little bit better as their joints get lubricated. Um, so you could work what I always tell people, I change my language when I want to work with somebody who has a spinal compression, and I talk more about length. So everything I do has to do with trying to lengthen the spine and giving them that image. So example, simple example would be like coccyx curl. So if you were gonna do coccyx curl, instead of letting them, which especially I find that my older men like to just <laughs> hunker down and press hard into the floor with their abs. So instead of that, I try and coach them into finding length and space, so sacral, pulling away, lengthening the spine as you move into the coccyx curl, and then reversing back to more neutral. And sometimes putting the hands on the thighs, I'll show you what I mean, as they're rolling down can make a difference there too. So if I was gonna coccyx curl, oops, here, I could, pull my belly in, I can then put my hands here so that as I start to coccyx curl, I'm just self-tractioning a little bit and then coming back downward. So I'm just trying to create that image of length from the tail through the body, through that spine, and then releasing. Right. And with my clients, I put my, I sometimes will actually even put my hand under the sacrum and give them a little bit of that feeling if you're comfortable enough with the client to do that. But just as they roll down, give them a little bit of that feeling of what it would feel like kind of hooking right at the base of the spine with the, the base of my hand so that they feel like, oh, there's that length and then I can release. And so I try and find exercises like that where it is more about lengthening the spine um, so that would be an example in coccyx curl. You could do that in bottom lift. One of our favorites at our studio is the knees over the bar of the tower or the Cadillac, um, where you're hanging the knees over, holding neutral spine, just tapping toes, tapping heels, or even doing little bridges with the knees over the bar, because that creates that length. And then the other one is the feet in the trapeze, doing the breathing, so bridging basically with the lap pull. Where, and then you can even get on their feet and kind of give them a little traction as they roll down through their spine. So those are the ones that seem to be really nice. And then overall, we're strengthening in as neutral as we can get for functional work. But then if neutral still bothers, then moving towards a flat back or supported like we did, we talked about for the cotton quina, 
if you have to wedge them in order to, or get them to squat back in order to have no pain, then you would go there. But typically you can start to work in, in the neutral position. And initially I don't do much prone with them. I do more quadruped, all fours, just because it's a little easier than being flat on the tummy. I worry that the back's gonna arch down and with that arching back into the floor, they then get the compression and symptomatic. Um, but if you can put them on all fours, you can sometimes avoid that or on the arc like Allegra was trying to do. So their body is in this curved position and then they can just lift their legs up to neutral rather than lifting into extension, right? So hanging over the, the big barrel or the arc or something like that sometimes actually feels quite good. Um, and then you can decide if they can lift or not. So that, that's sort of where it starts and then see how you do and then work to strengthen. Yeah. Great. Any other questions on that same idea of osteoarthritis? Great. Any other questions in general? Hi. I oh, sort of I have, have uh, a strange kind of situation. Um, nice to meet you. I have been taking classes with um, Annalise at Mighty in Larkspur oh, and uh, and Rebecca Bonnell, uh, who's been, I've been doing privates with her. I don't know if you're also familiar with her, but she had recommended, this is like such a, a weird world because I was somehow in this Pilates, cause I teach Pilates mat only. I haven't been certified in any of the equipment. Um, and, um, hi Lori. And, um, I was struggling with the left side chain of my body, just in general, just feeling a lot of weakness in the whole left chain. And so I've been working with Rebecca and kind of strengthening all the different components, but I feel quite overwhelmed with like where to start. And then I just had a recent injury where I fell down the stairs onto a table onto my left rib cage. So this is like for me, which is why I feel like this is a strange request, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it can be helpful for my clients as well, but, um, yeah, so I was just wondering, I, I reached out to actually uh, Laura at, at Synergy to see if, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll see if I can work with her as well. But yeah, I just wanted to say hi and see if you had any thoughts. I'm sure it's like a pretty robust issue that I'm listing, so. Yeah, well, tell me a little bit more. So you were having trouble connecting through the left side of the body in what sense, like in, when do you notice it, in standing or in... Um, um, so for example, in a kneeling position, when I'm kind of pulling my arms back, uh, I have trouble, my art, my low back on my left side starts to arch and I can't, I can't squeeze my left glute tight enough to press it forward enough. Um, that's mm -hmm. one example. Another example is like in my foot, I find that I tend to like fall in towards the arch, um, on the left side. And then my left rib cage doesn't wrap in as much as my right. Um, and I think this might be originally caused by, I have a little scoliosis. scoliosis. And so I was just gonna ask. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering, cause I took, I've been doing Pilates for about 10 years, but I'm a psychotherapist as well. So I've been, I took like, I haven't been as active in it in the last two years or so. And then during this shutdown, I've been trying to re-engage and strengthen and mm -hmm. yeah. So that's kind of, does that help a little bit with some yeah. of it? Yeah, it does help. Um, so I was going to ask, my next question was going to be, do you, could it possibly be that you have a little bit of a scoliosis? So um, that is typically um, the rib cage, right? Won't wrap in as much. It won't be the same side to side. Um, and a lot of people feel that they have, one side that won't activate as well. And then your description of the foot falling in on that left side. So my guess is that over time, you've sort of developed this overuse probably on the right and underuse on the left, which has contributed to the glute and hip. Um, and it's really interesting how connected the foot can be to the glute. So if that foot is dropping in and the foot itself is not strong enough, then you may um, not be able to access that glute very well just because of that on, on your regular daily basis. And so there's no feedback going there. And then it just kind of gets kind of loose and not as strong, right? You're just not using it. 
Um, so I think, you know, not knowing much, but just to say what I would do is I would probably look at, take a look or have somebody take a look at that, your long chain, right? That what is happening from the ground all the way up the chain to the hip. And then the rib cage, I, it's interesting. It will be a little bit different to connect, but if you can get the lat connection down, I That's wouldn't worry. I've been trying, yeah. Yeah. So that, that I would definitely work for that. But then I wouldn't worry too much about where the rib cage ends up sitting because okay. you have, to, you have a structural difference and there's going to be a little bit of a something somewhere okay. that's a little bit different but what you want to try and do is make sure that it's flexible it stays flexible that your spine yeah. stays flexible in both sides and that so that you don't end up fixed in anything so flexible side to side flexible flexion to extension like really keeping the spine supple will help you and then you'll be able to co have somebody correct in your Pilates practice uh, that you're even, you want to still try and work for even, but not worry so much about the rib cage being uneven. Worry about mm -hmm. is the weight load even on both my arms? Can I get both my shoulder blades down? Can I connect? Um, and can I do, you know, all these nice arm things that we do without me pulling myself sideways? Like, can I keep right. faced forward? Those, that's more where I would go with that. And then yeah. for the foot, for the feet, you know, I might. I'm, I, and I haven't looked at your body really, but I just off the top of my head, I might say you might consider having in, insoles in your shoes if you don't that help you hold the arches right so that you're more likely to activate properly up the chain without mm -hmm. having to think about it so much. And then I would definitely strengthen feet and then start from feet and hip glute rotators and then try and put yourself in positions where you're having to activate and maybe even doing little tiny subtle activations for the glutes mm -hmm. um, and the inner thighs to get them fired before you even try and do yeah. bigger yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. So I have to do that before I like walk even or before I go on hikes or something like that. I, I find that it's really important for me to just like basically say, hello, wake up and then I can and then kind do. of. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're on the right track. Um, I think it's aware, awareness is always the first step. And then probably, probably thinking about the fact that we in Pilates love to work both sides equally, but that might not be the right approach. Yeah. For you. Yeah. you might want to strengthen a lot more on that left side and not as yeah. much on the right side. I would probably say strengthen a lot on the left and stretch to release on the right. right. A lot. So the right doesn't right. take over. Yeah, And you might avoid things like the feet and the straps on the reformer because your right mm -hmm. leg might get is probably doing all the work because that's yeah. a pulley. Whereas on the tower or springboard, you uh, have separate work happening. So you could maybe do it there rather than right. legs and straps. On or just there. single leg. I've been trying to do a lot of single leg work in the with my leg in the strap and just kind of working yeah. the also just. I've been trying to do a lot with the TVA because I feel like that just powers up so much of everything. Um, but yeah, I am hoping that's why I'm, I think I just feel a little bit like not knowing exactly always where to start because it feels like the entire thing is weak. And so um, I'd probably go after the glute. I'd go after the foot and the glute and then I would start connecting both directions from there. I mean, the foot, I would probably support the foot as much as I could still work on things like footwork and balancing and toe work and stuff like that. But I'd probably attack the glutes and then go in both directions from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. That way we get, you get up on your hip and then yeah. you, can, then you can I've been trying that. to work the, you know, um, the thing where you kind of drop like, practice like mm -hmm. pressing in the heel into the foot bar and dropping the hip with like yes. a straight leg um, yes. because I found that that's been helping support and then also strengthening again it's like oblique I mean it's like literally the whole left side but yeah it just feels overwhelming which I think is why I want to work with someone privately to just like because I I could just sit in my room for like three hours every day and just do everything. And it's like too much time. So I like need to like be like, these are the 10 exercises you need to do. Yes. 
Yeah, I agree. It could be, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I think Laura would be great if she can help guide you and then just get you on track. And then I think it's important for you to have somebody looking at what you're doing, yes. probably, which I think you realize Definitely. Too, because it's really hard to feel where you are when things aren't exactly straight. Exactly. Like I kept trying to overcorrect and I think I was overcorrecting in the wrong way. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Is that the best way to reach out to Laura is just to write through the website? Yeah, you can. Um, or I can shoot an email. Um, if you want to email me, you can do that too. And I can set forward it on. It's just Zaina at synergypilates.com or Laura is also, um, it's Laura winner at synergypilates.com or you can just send it to info through the right through the website and we'll get it. Yeah. Okay. I think Annalise may have sent me your email too. So I may. Okay. Yeah. Great. Or tell her and she'll, or give her. Right. Right. Oh yeah. She did send me it. Oh, she did send me it. So I'll just, I'll just send you that. Thank you so much. I know that's a bit, a bit out of the scope of this normal call being about myself, but yeah. That's okay. It's a good case study. (laughs) It's still a good case study. (laughs) Yeah. Um, great. Any other, Genevieve, were you all good? Did you have any questions? We can't hear you. <laughs> I'm muted. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I don't have any really specific questions, but um, I guess maybe one Um, that pertains to both Allegra and my client. Um, So he um, is an elderly man (laughs) and he plays golf a lot. Um, And he's recently gotten back into it after a a low back strain. Um, And lately I've been noticing a really significant hip hike on the left side. Um, He's very um, kind of just bent over on that side. Um, and so the last couple sessions, I've done a lot of side bending, particularly holding on that side. We did some just like lay over the barrel and let your legs hang and, and kind of do that traction a little bit. Um, but I'm curious about your thoughts because it's also that side, his golf swing, right? He's a right-handed golfer. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about that because, you know, I don't know how much we want him to be potentially twisting. I don't think he's arthritis or I don't think he's um, uh, osteoporosis at all. You know, he's a pretty sturdy guy, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. So I know him too, Shira, just so you know, I know who they're talking about. And he absolutely loves golf and that is his life. His retired life is golf and he's in his eighties. So um, he's not going to stop playing golf. And what I think he's done is found a compensatory way to play without aggravating the back. And that he, so you said he's leaned over, hip piped on the left, right? Hip hip piped up left. Hip piped on the left and his, his, recent low back strain was on the right. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I don't know what to tell you other than I think you're on the right track with the side bends and hanging over and the tractioning. Uh, What you actually though, actually what you might look at. And so a lot of times, so he has spinal stenosis too. So a lot of times, when I'm going to imagine that's his left hip, right? And it's going to be, I know it's looking like it's going out sideways, but hip hiked in sideways is usually what happens. Sometimes that happens because the spine itself is actually taking a little curve in it. So you might take a look and see if you stand him next to a wall with his right hip next to the wall and have him just try and hip shift into the wall and then go back, right? So just a subtle hip shift into the wall. Do you want me to show you? I can show you what I'm in with a real live body. Ooh, hold on, I lost you. Okay, there, I've done something. Okay, let me see if you can see me standing up. Yeah, okay, 
You don't need, you don't need to see my head. <laughs> All right, so if I'm um, imagining, right, he's going to be a little bit, uh, actually, hip hike left. Is this what he looks like, kind of hip hike left up this way? Or does he look more like that way? Mm. I think I think the first way. This yeah. way, more yeah. hip hike left. Okay, so. Agree, What's that? Would you agree that that's how he's been standing? I, you know, Genevieve, I guess, you know, this is, I actually have not noticed because we go to the reformer and then we stand up and he's just like, go, go, go. And I, yeah, I have not noticed. And now I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. So yeah, I'm listening with true intent here. Okay. All right. Well, let's just say that this is what it is. Like a hip hike left. Hip hike left means my spine is curving this way. I'm exaggerating, right? This C curve with the hollow on the left, right? So what you can do sometimes to help this is take this hip that's hiked, put them at the wall. You're not going to be able to see. I'm going to pretend that this is my wall. My roller is my wall. Right, so I'm hip hiked here. And what you can do is tell them to come to the wall and try and hip shift into the wall and then come back to wherever they feel comfortable. And then the hip shift into the wall. So by hip shifting into the wall, I'm essentially unwinding that extra curve, the extra curve that's happening in the spine. But if I go here, I'm straightening my spine. Right? And that should lower the hip back down, ideally. Right? So it's whichever side, if it's height, it's whichever side. If you go back and you look at him and you go, darn it, he wasn't actually hip hiked. He was side bent. So maybe it looks like a, I'm going to exaggerate, right? But it can look like a hip hike if they're side bent over that way. So take a look and see, determine if you think it's hip hike or side bent. If you look at it and go, gosh, we talked about hip hike, but it was side bent. If it's side bent, it's actually kind of the opposite thing that you do. You come to the wall, but instead you're going to lift up the arm and take the side to the wall and then release back, right? So arm up, side to the wall. So if you can determine whether it's hip height or whether it's side, um, then you'll be able to figure out. If you're still not sure, you won't hurt him by doing it just a subtle motion of both and see in which one gets his spine and his body to be aligned better. Right? So sometimes it's really subtle and it's really hard to tell but you could, that you'll see it when they're straight. You know that something's off, but it's hard to see what that is. But then you know, you, you'll know when they're straight and aligned, right? So then you can try one, try a little hip shift. Well, let's see, that hip doesn't look right. Hip shift this way, that didn't do it. Let's hip shift the other way. Hmm, that didn't actually do it either. Okay, let's see. Let me take a look higher up. Oh, is it maybe from your spine? What if we do this against the wall? Does that give, give you the look of being straightened? Do you, do you end up weighting your legs or putting weight on both legs at that point? So you're not going to hurt somebody by doing these subtle motions once or twice to figure it out. So you shouldn't worry about that. And then just see if you can get them aligned and try these little subtle changes. And then once, once you get them there, sometimes I have them do a little bit of something with their arms like maybe give him a TheraBand and tell him to just pull the TheraBand in slightly up the side or the other spin band into the side, like, um, so that you're stabilizing the spine in that alignment. That could work. Or if you feel like they're stable enough, lifting up one leg, but probably not in his case. Yeah. 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 Because it's presenting sort of um, like, yeah, he, he can't get that right foot under without bending it, bending the knee, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and it's also yeah. that his, because of that right low back strain, he's now got like a hyper height glute on the right. And okay. And if that's yeah. sort of hiding him. him or, yeah. Sorry, did you say hyper hiked or hyper tight? Hyper tight. tight. Hyper tight. Okay. Yeah, like that figure four stretch on the right, you could just have them hang out there for 
a while and he'll <laughs> be like, oh, this feels so good, you know? <laughs> so Yeah. You could, I mean, if he uh, needs more unwinding too, which may be the case, you could refer him to Laura or you could refer him to Elizabeth for massage to try and unwind some of that. And yeah. uh, that could, and he may need a little pelvis alignment muscle release work too, if he's still stuck in that. I know he was going to physical therapy for it, but I don't know who he was seeing. Yeah, so, seen somewhere, going somewhere, but he seemed really happy with them, but I don't know if he's still going or if he just has a home program. Yeah, maybe ask him and yeah. say, when you get this unwound, maybe he'd be willing to do a session with Elizabeth and you could guide him and just from the massage and you could just tell her what you're seeing or we can communicate with her about what needs to unwind more. But yeah, I think I, I think I would try those little subtle hip shift or spine shift and then go back to sort of the side bending. I think the side bending isn't usually the right approach. It may just take a little while. And if you wound up all on the right side glute and up in the back, um, then it's going to take a little while longer probably to un undo itself. Yeah. And, and the golfing doesn't help. But, but he's going to golf. <laughs> he's going to golf. <laughs> so, 